welcome to Uplift Long Beach. This is going to be kind of exciting. There's going to be a lot of different stuff. I just found out about this about two minutes ago. That's not true. I actually made a video for this. You should check it out. We're giving away a t-shirt for the high low. And uh, I made a uh, little uh, spot for it on my porch. And uh, I think it kind of redefined cinema. But that's just me. Anyways, I'll be kind of uh, your guide, which is scary because I don't know where we're going. But that's the fun of this, is that we're going to be talking to people. People are going to be talking to us. There's going to be a magician, okay? Do you hear what I'm saying? Paul Case magician. Uh, Dirty Patty, our good friend the puppet, will be there. There's going to be acts and all of this in support of Long Beach's wonderful arts community and other small businesses which support and suffuse that community. It's a great cause and actually it's a great way to spend about, what do we got here Steve, an hour and a half, two hours? How long are we going to be doing that? About an hour and a half. What else you got going on? You got nothing. You know what I'm going to do after? friends so while me and mr crumb are waiting out the stay in your house order we decided to make some things we all have right here at home what i've done with mine is i've taken some glasses and filled them with different amounts of water to change the note and you can hear our major scale mr crumb has taken a household saw and my bass bow to get a nice beautiful bowed instrument let's hear that Nice. That's beautiful. Great job, man. So what we're going to do is we're going to try and play a little bit of Katy Perry's Firework and see if we can pull it off with these instruments we, we made right here at home. You ready, Mr. Crumb? Uh, yeah. Nice. Hi, Long Beach. Welcome to Uplift LB. On behalf of the Board Arts Council, I just want to say thank you for making us um, a part of this. We are going to be taking in all of the donations for the Uplift LB program and sharing it with artists and performers and small businesses and nonprofits. And for that, we're ever grateful. Thank you. You are an awesome team. Uh, the nonprofit partnership has been a wonderful collaborator during this pandemic as well. So thank you so much for your help. Just want to take a moment to ask you if you have the time the room, the space in your lives right now to give to artists, performers, small businesses and nonprofits. Uh, do so tonight. Um, we are working hard to ensure that they have everything they need at this time uh, through this program and through some other efforts. I want to thank the mayor, um, the city team, every all essential workers and frontline workers that are making our lives safer and healthier. Um, you all know that I strongly believe, as does the board and the staff, that arts are part of our lives and they're an essential part of our lives. They help illuminate our lives at this darkness 
They help alleviate our stress and anxiety, and they will help us recuperate as we move forward in this uh, pandemic. So have fun tonight. Enjoy all the chefs and the music and the arts. Um, thank you for letting us be a part of it. And we wanted to share a little bit about what we have been doing in a short video. So enjoy, have fun. Thank you so much. Have a good night. I'm Gabriela Martinez, Director of Education at MOLA. The Museum of Latin American Art is proud to exhibit the installation of For the Pride of Your Hometown, The Way of the Elders, and In Memory of a Forgotten by Oaxacan artistic duo Tlacolulocos, Dario Canul y Cosijoesa Cernas. This installation showcases murals from visualizing language, a project organized for the 2017 Pacific Standard Time LALA LA initiative by the Library Foundation of Los Angeles and the Los Angeles Public Library. These large scale paintings explore the intersection of language and culture as a key lifeline, sustaining the shared experience between Los Angeles, Mexico and beyond. By exploring the history of indigenous peoples and underrepresentation, the murals address how migration and the socio-political environment shape identity and cultural traditions. Culture, history, and migration from south to north and from north to south are the central axis in this series of murals. The artists worked on the crossing that occurs during transnational movement, placing the focus on language as an instrument of social development and cultural connection. The works incorporate the indigenous Zapotec language, demonstrating the diversity of languages found in the state of Oaxaca. The inclusion of native symbols, clothing, and subjects show the continuity and persistence of indigenous customs. These murals are now a part of the MOLA permanent collection and will continue to be available to the public for years to come. The current exhibition, Oaxaca, California, through the experience of the duo Tlaculu Locos, presents the artist's significance within the context of Latinx communities in California. The museum presents these murals with comprehensive and dynamic interpretive programming, including an easily accessible audio tour that expands on the symbols used in each mural.
Hola, soy Gabriela Urtiaga, curadora en jefe del Museo de Arte Latinoamericano de Long Beach, California. El Museo de Arte Latinoamericano de Long Beach, California, se complace en presentar la gran instalación para el orgullo de tu pueblo, por el camino de los viejos y recuerdo de los olvidados, del dúo artístico oaxaqueño Tracolu Locos, compuesto por Darío Canul y Cosijo Esa Cernas. Esta exhibición presenta los murales del proyecto Visualizando el Lenguaje, Oaxaca en el ley, organizada por la Biblioteca Pública de Los Ángeles y su fundación para la iniciativa Pacific Standard Time, LA, LA. Los murales exploran la intersección de idiomas y culturas como un hilo de vida esencial que sostiene las experiencias compartidas entre México y Los Ángeles. Al enfocarnos en explorar la historia y la baja representación de las comunidades indígenas, los murales discuten cómo la migración y el ambiente sociopolítico dan forma a la identidad y a las tradiciones culturales. La cultura, la historia y la migración, de sur a norte y de norte a sur, son el eje central en esta serie de pinturas a gran escala. Los artistas trabajaron en ese cruce que se produce entre movimientos transnacionales y ponen el foco en el lenguaje como instrumento de desarrollo social y conexión cultural, evidenciando la diversidad de lenguas de Oaxaca con sus lenguas indígenas zapoteca y la continuidad de sus tradiciones. Estos murales ya son parte de la colección permanente de Mola y continuarán disponibles al público como parte de la exhibición Oaxaca California a través de la experiencia del dúo Tracolulocos. Esta muestra presenta la relevancia de los artistas dentro del contexto de las comunidades latinex en California. Las obras son acompañadas por un programa educativo dinámico que amplía el significado de los símbolos en cada mural. Chef Louise's Catering here in Long Beach. 
Today, uh, as we're all in quarantine, I am going to teach you how to turn this into this. So, we're making salted caramel banana bread today. Um, I make my own caramel, but I would suggest that you just buy a caramel for this recipe. The recipe is going to be on our website within a couple of days, and that is chefluise.catering. Um, so you can look that up in a few days. First of all, in our stand mixer, I'm going to put all of the wet ingredients. So, so far, I have one and a half cups of sugar and half a cup of oil. I'm going to go ahead and put one third of a cup of buttermilk. If you don't have buttermilk, you can actually take cream and just add about one to two teaspoons of, of lemon juice and that will turn it into buttermilk. Wanted to point out one thing, when measuring, this is for wet ingredients and this one is for dry ingredients. This is also dry. So we've got those things in, we're going to crack two eggs. I always crack my eggs into a separate bowl just in case you get a little bit of eggshell in there. You can recover it better from a bowl or a container rather than in this mixing bowl. So the last thing to do is the vanilla, good quality vanilla. We have one teaspoon of vanilla. So again, what's in here is two eggs, one and a half cups of sugar, half a cup of oil, and a third of a cup of buttermilk. I'm gonna turn that on low. And while that's going, we're going to go ahead and sift the dry ingredients. Dry ingredients is one and three quarters cup of flour, one teaspoon of baking soda, and half a teaspoon of salt. Everything sifted together nicely there. Even if you don't think you have any lumps, it's just worth doing that, aerate it, make sure that everything's good. And then the last thing is the bananas. So, bananas, if they get a little bit too um, ripe for you to eat, what I do, if you don't have enough time to make the banana bread as soon as they're ripe, too ripe, I throw them in the freezer. And then just about half an hour before you're ready to do this cake, bread, then you just take them out and defrost them. If you have bananas that are not quite ripe enough, then you can throw them in a 250 degree oven for about 15 to 20 minutes. And that will ripen them up enough to use. So we have three bananas here, really nice and soft. And I actually, like a few chunks of banana in my banana bread. So I don't actually mush it up that much. And it will get mixed in with the mixer as well. So mix, add those to that. Then I'm going to turn it off, lift it up, and just smooth down the sides just to make sure we're not missing anything. mix that around a little bit just to make sure it's all mixed together. Now we're going to take the dry ingredients. One very important thing about when adding the mixing in the dry ingredients to the wet ingredients is don't over mix it. It is just until combined. So we'll just do that very, very quickly. And that's it, we'll lift that up. See a few bits of flour in there. So we're gonna scrape down the sides. 
And then here we have the banana bread tin. And I have already buttered and floured it. And then for extra precaution, I've gone ahead and put some parchment in there as well. Last thing that you want is to not be able to get your banana bread out. So we're going to pour this right in here. Scrape down, make sure that you get everything in. And that is going to go into a 350 degree oven with fan if you have it. If you don't have it, it will probably take a little bit longer. I cook this for about 35 to 40 minutes. So here we have the end result. When testing the banana bread, you put in toothpick, it needs to come out clean, okay? So here I have my ready-made salted caramel. This is a little bit uh, difficult to make, so I would just buy a caramel sauce to drizzle on the top. If it isn't salted caramel, then you can just add some sea salt. You want to put some of this on as soon as it comes out of the oven, but that's gonna soak right in. So then as soon as it cools down a little bit, then you can add a little bit more. I'm gonna wait until that's a little cooler before you take it out. And then I would wait for at least half an hour to an hour before you enjoy it. Um, if you're like me, you probably can't resist. But uh, there we have, salty caramel banana bread. Perfect for when you're staying at home. Holly Jane here, owner of Aerial Butterflies. Please enjoy these highlights of us performing around the city.
that was amazing. I need to stretch. Uh, next, we've got um, Hilo Liquor coming up to show how to make a Mezcal Negroni. Now, a lot of people ask, since we are the Hilo here at uh, LB Post, are we in any way connected to the Hilo Liquor? We are not, except for a deep and profound love of alcohol and alcohol-like products. They sell it. We buy it. It's a beautiful symbiotic relationship. And uh, I think that's what we're all here for. So enjoy. Hi, welcome to Hilo. We're going to celebrate Cinco de Mayo today with a staff favorite cocktail around here, the Mezcal Negroni. Now, just like any Negroni, it's going to be equal parts of all the ingredients. We're going to start with a really great vegetable Mezcal, one ounce of that. We're going to move into a really rich sweet vermouth, one ounce, and of course, the bitter part, also one ounce. You're going to want to stir this drink for a long time to get it good and cold. 45 seconds, I would say, at least. The key to any cocktail, but certainly the aromatic Negroni, is temperature. Cold, cold, cold. That's what's best. Strain it into your glass. And yes, it should be garnished with an orange. But Cinco de Mayo and everything, it's alive now on Cinco de Mayo. So, the Mezcal Negroni. We are doing this cocktail as a part of Give Tuesday, which is Cinco de Mayo. And we are honoring Give Tuesday here in Long Beach uh, with Uplift LB, which is a campaign to donate to local artists and small businesses. Please give when and where you can. Remember, you have to be 21 and over to enjoy alcohol. Please come by Hilo and Long Beach for all your Cinco de Mayo needs. Happy Cinco de Mayo, by the way. And if you want to learn more about it, Gloria Rono, who has wonderful shows at her house, has uh, some stuff to tell you about this. Get a little smarter. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us again here at uh, Uplift LB. And um, with us uh, to share a little bit about Cinco de Mayo is uh, Dr. Gloria Arcona. Uh, she is, she teaches Spanish at Caltech and she's also one of our arts council board members. Happy to be here. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> um, I know that today is giving Tuesday and we're celebrating and honoring through donation, a lot of our small businesses and artists and performers. Yes. And it's also Taco Tuesday uh -huh. and it's also Cinco de Mayo. There's a Cinco lot to do today, uh -huh. right, Gloria? Yes, that's great. I mean, for everybody. So <laughs> there is no excuse to right. not celebrate today. Yes. So we just wanted to give a little moment to talk about Cinco de Mayo and, and say what it is or what it isn't. And um, I thought of you. And so thank you for uh, doing a little mini lecture for us during okay. Uplift LB. So let's just start with the big one, right? Um, is Cinco de Mayo Mexican Independence Day? No. <laughs> Although many people believe so, uh, is uh, in fact it's kind of a minor battle because it was a, a battle against the French in 1862, and that Mexico over um, took over the sovereignty of a of his, its people and uh, defeated, this is the most important thing, that, that's why we celebrate that uh, Mexico defeated uh, the French, which were the most um, powerful army back in those times. So unfortunately, I say that it's symbolic because it was one of the many battles that uh, Mexico uh, won, but uh, the French were indeed in Mexico for five year, years. Uh, they had a mini empire from 1862 to 1867. Okay. And so tell me about these French people. Are these the people that are behind me yes, here looking at me? They are watching you. <laughs> you sent me? Yes, yes. Okay. And, if, and in fact, is I mean, this is like a soap opera because I behind me is uh, Benito Juarez, the big hero. And uh, Maximiliano and Carlota, they, they were actually really um, victims of, uh, of uh, they believed that the people of Mexico wanted them. So they came 
to Mexico because uh, some uh, conservative people, mainly, they wanted a uh, French empire. Uh, so, you know, Benito Juarez was our president back then. He was an Indian from Oaxaca, and some uh, people didn't want to have an Indian mm. among the other things as uh, the representative. So they called uh, Maximiliano and Carlota. But I say that they were victims because they really believed that the Mexicans, all of them, wow. wanted them to have to be in Mexico. Very and in many ways, Benito Juarez liked Maximiliano because he was a liberal, uh, Maximiliano was a, a liberal thinker. Okay. Benito Juarez was a liberal too. Wow. So, I mean, is it, is it okay to reduce this, the, the Cinco de Mayo or as it known, La Batalla de Puebla, right? Yes. To, to this idea that uh, Mexico and, and the people in the battle were really fighting against other people coming into their country, particularly these two monarchs? Is it well, I think so because of, of the history. You know, the 19th century was a tough uh, century, the whole century for Mexico, first the independent, independence war in 1810, and then uh, one French intervention, because there were actually three French interventions, and then the war between the United States and Mexico. So Mexico was really fighting for its sovereign sovereignty correct the word yes <laughs> sovereignty yes yes so that yes. i mean that, that is not that they were not allowing uh, immigrants or or something right. like that to be here but right. they were fighting because mexico had just lost a few decades back not too many decades back because uh, the u.s mexico war was in um 1846 1847 so just even 20 years before, they had lost most, uh, more than half of its territory. So there were many reasons yeah. to be afraid of. Yeah. So um, how is Cinco de Mayo celebrated in Mexico? Is it celebrated? Some people think like it doesn't happen in Mexico at all. It only happens in the U.S. Oh, no. I, I think it's, I mean, we do not celebrate it as a fiesta, <laughs> as a fiesta type, well, the fiesta is always present, right? The food and drinks and everything, but after, after the main dish, which is the ceremony. There are many ceremonies and a very artistic one, Griselda. There's many um, ceremonies that uh, the people are involved, like a big representations in, in Puebla, in Querétaro. There are big theatrical representations of the Battle of Puebla in which the people participate. So I find it really amazing. It's just that they are doing a big representation and people are participating as the French or as the Mexicans. And, uh, and, and something that I, since I, I'm involved in the music and something I, I like a lot uh, is a, a in Canciones de la Intervención, intervention repertoire that we have and we always sing in, in the schools uh, or in, in groups like uh, Bohemias, we sing those of beautiful, those, some of those beautiful uh, songs that we have that are, are mainly parodies mm. of the French, like Mama Carlota, La Paloma, eh, oh. de Juarez, etc. And why do you think um, it's so important? Why is it so big in the United States? Have you thought about this? This is, these are my theories, okay? <laughs> and I believe there is not always right. one single reason, but as I mentioned before, uh, there had been a big battle, uh, not big battle, a big war between the United States and Mexico, and Mexico had lost more than half of its territory back in 1846, 1848. And uh, many people from Mexican ancestry stay in the United States. They were very nationalistic. They had to stay here because it was their country and suddenly they, it was not their country anymore. And one of them is a, one of the generals, El General Zaragoza, which is a very interesting story because she, he was born Mexican and he died American. He was born in Texas. Okay. So I believe that the nationalism of the people living in 
in what today was today is the United States. Well, is a big reason why people uh, there is a tradition of celebration here in the United States. Another obvious reason is that the United States, uh, the government didn't want uh, an empire, a French empire next door because they had ah. other plans, right? <laughs> yeah. So, so those are a few reasons, and of course, maybe more than that. But definitely, mm -hmm. I know that it is it has been always celebrated here in the United States. Oh, okay. Well, look, we've learned something today. Thank you. Um, it's so interesting. And is there like any foods that you know that French brought to Mexico that we can still, that we still see yeah. today in Mexican, Mexican yeah. cuisine? Um, how do you call these at the, the youth? Uh, cre crepes? Crepas, we say. Crepas, in, in, crepes. Yeah, there is a tradition in Guadalajara, in Mexico, in the big cities of uh, uh, creperias. Mm. And uh, that's, that's only one of the contribution of the French. But something more important that is always a surprise that it just came to my mind is that the charro suit. Mm -hmm. is, I'm not saying uh, that the charro suit was invented by the French, but Maximiliano, he used to, to take a lot of care of his appearance and he adopted the, what he considered to be the, the suit, the... the the tradition that the attire representative of Mexico because he really wanted to be a Mexican. So he <laughs> started to use it what was a, the common vaquero or um, even um, chinaco suit, okay. but he was more pretentious and he had money. So he ornamented that with a lot of oh. golden and silver uh, buttons. And since then, our mariachi and our charro suits uh, owe that to Maximiliano. Well, there you go. Yes. That's awesome. <laughs> I, I, I learned something as well. well. Thank you. I'm so glad yeah. to hear that. <laughs> that Griselda well, learned something that you knew a lot already. <laughs> well, I mean, there's, it's good to be reminded, right, about all these connections. Absolutely. I, I love it. And um, I, I thank you again for joining us for Uplift yeah. LB and sure. telling us a little bit about Cinco de Mayo and and people can uh, donate by learn we oh, learned yes. a lot today. So come on and join the donation. Give us a little boost. Give us a little tip for this lecture. And Gloria, Dr. Gloria Arjona, I'm so excited um, that you joined us. And have a wonderful rest of your evening. And I was, as, as you heard in the background here, we were getting ready to make some margaritas. <laughs> That's maybe another lecture for next time. Where did the yeah, margaritas And, and margaritas are welcome. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, All right. Thank pleasure. you, Gloria. You're welcome. Have fun, everybody. Okay. Bye. Another trivia question, and I'm going to go out on a limb and say, don't answer Dwight David Eisenhower for this one, okay? Uh, this one, you get 50 bucks to the grocery outlet again. Uh, same thing, win at lbpost.com. Uh, the subject line is Trivia 3. Now, I want to rush through that because, ladies and gentlemen, coming next, yep, we've been talking about it, Paul Case magician you know with the magician we're talking magic hello and thank you for watching i hope everybody's doing well out there now i'd like to show you a piece of magic using this scarf i'm not saying it's real magic then again i'm not saying it isn't real magic either i'll just show it to you and you'll have to decide for yourself the way i did fair enough now watch what happens grab a handful of this pristine california air i take the scarf and i stick it into my hand just like that the scarf goes into my hand and comes out the other end a different color. I know, it's, it changes color in my hand. It's like hand dyeing. The last time I did this, I told the audience, I will now die, and the audience applauded. Anyway, continue sticking this into my hand just like that, and it comes out the other end a different color. Just like that. Now, I'm going to teach you the intricate workings of, of this feat of plastidigi, plastidigi, ledger -dum -dum magic trick. Here's how this works. See, before the show started, I had hidden in my hand, unbeknownst to the audience, another scarf. It uses two scarves, you see. It's a trick. Yeah, see, so if you want to do this for your friends, just make sure you have that one stuffed all the way in your hand, just like that. And you wave this one around. 
This is what we magicians call misdirection. This is what we magicians call hiding something in your hand. Now, if you're going to hide something in your hand like this, you want to really, really act natural. I'm acting natural. And wave this one around. Now, one thing you don't want to do, if you're going to do this for your friends, you don't want to open your hand like that. You don't want to do that. So what I'm going to do is stuff this into my hand just like that. Goes in and comes out a different color. But as we both know now, this is just a trick. It's not real. It's not an illusion. It just looks like one. One thing you don't want to do is pull this all the way out like that. That'll give everything away. So keep that in there just like that until you finish shoving that scarf all the way in and wave this one around like that. Any questions? Very good. We'll move on. Now we've all seen a magician take a piece of rope and cut it into two pieces and then put the two pieces back together again, right? Well, I'm going to do that, but I'm going to show you the intricate workings of this piece of magic. Fair enough? No. I've got a piece of rope here. I'm going to cut it into two pieces. And then I'm going to put the two pieces magically back together again. There you go. Two pieces of rope. This is where the magic happens. Say the magic words, make magic gestures. And once again, we have one piece of rope. Isn't that amazing? I'm sensing some skepticism from some members of the audience. So I'll start again. One piece of rope. I'm going to cut this into in half, giving us two pieces of rope. There we go. Two pieces of rope. Am I going too quickly? I'll tell you what, I'll start again. One piece of rope. Now, one thing you want to do is don't lose track of the where the ends of the rope are, because they'll try and get away from you. Got the ends of the rope right there. These ends will try and get away from you just like that. That leaves you with one big long loop of rope, and you don't want that. So you've got to take this little piece here and drape it over the big long loop, just like that. Okay, little piece, hang on there. Once again, one long piece of rope. Oh, sorry, that's my other show. Okay, moving on. As I was telling you, the ends will try and get away from you, just like that. See, watch. This end of this rope will sneak through there, sneak through the inside of the cord, just on the other side, just like that. You don't need that. So you need to squeeze this so it goes all the way through. There you go, giving us one piece of rope once again. Sometimes when I'm doing this, people think I'm using phony fake magician's rope. That's not true. The phony fake magician's rope is over here. This is real honest-to-goodness rope like you would find in any bedroom. In fact, in fact, I'll show you something that happens to all of us. In the morning, you're tying your shoes, just like that. You get an end of a loop, end of a shoestring through each end of the loops there, right there. So what do you do? We all do this. You reach in your pocket, you pull out some pixie dust, you throw it on there, and giving you, once again, one piece of rope. So... You guys don't get pixie dust out here? Well, I'll give, I'll give you a clue. I, I grind my own using only the finest imported pixies. But you got to send the kids out of the room. Pixies make a lot of noise in the blender. That can be disturbing to young people. Moving on. One piece of rope. Going to cut it in half once again. One last time. One final time. Cluing you into the intricate workings of this piece of magic. Now, one last time, I'm going to tie these two together. Creating the illusion of one piece of rope. But you all know it's just the two pieces tied together. So I'm going to reach in, pull out the pixie dust, throw it on there. See the magic words, hocus cadaver. And once again, we have one piece of rope. For those of you who don't have access to pixie dust, I'll teach you an alternative method. Let's tie a little knot in this rope here. A little knot right there. This is what I call the red rope method. What I'm going to do is wrap the red rope around the white rope, just like that. We'll say some magic words, hocus cadabra, abracapocus, whatever. And that knot transfers from the white rope to the red rope. And just so that you know that that's from the white rope, take a look at that. We're done. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Paul Case. Thank you for watching. Everybody be safe out there. Thank you. Paul Case, ladies and gentlemen. 
Uh, another trivia question, this one about Paul. Uh, remember, win at lbpost.com. Uh, this will be trivia four. And for this one, you get a hundred bucks to Fabric Barn. Just think of all the fabric you could have. You wouldn't have to like put one fabric back. You could take all the fabric, right? A, a fabric copia, I would say, right? Is that a thing? <laughs> Hi guys! Hey, we're over here at the Funnel House in Long Beach, Shoreline Village, and I got my assistant here, Claudia. And we just wanted to maybe help you out with some dessert ideas over here. I know a lot of people are doing desserts at home now, they're getting creative, right? So, maybe we're going to show you how to make an ice cream sandwich. Um, we have various cookies, and what's cool is you can pick up whatever cookie you want. Like, you can have two different kinds of cookies. So, Claudia, you want to make them a show them how to make an ice cream sandwich. We take uh, one cookie and um, add some ice cream and then put a different cookie or the same cookie on top. And it's just a fun way to eat ice cream and cookies but all together as one dessert. We have some other items too that we're going to show you. I, I know it's Cinco de Mayo so we'll get to the churro making later, okay? But here's our ice cream sandwich. And you can see the ice cream's in the middle. And then you wrap it. And this is easy to do at home. Okay? Want a bite? <laughs> okay, so now I'm gonna show you how to make a funnel cake. It's a popular item, something you can also make at home. It is our signature item at the Funnel House. Um, you can find some recipes online. And we make it with canola oil. And we offer it with powdered sugar. We also offer fruits, and we have a funnel sundae, which we call a fun day, and we put ice cream and whipped cream on it. I mean, everything's better with whipped cream and ice cream, right? But the funnel cake is very popular, and you should try to make one at home. So, since it's Cinco de Mayo, it's appropriate to talk about our churro, which is very popular as well. We make the batter here, and we cook it fresh hand twisted, it's an authentic churro. We also have the churro sundae variation that Claudia is holding. And you can add ice cream and syrups. This one has caramel and whipped cream and it is delicious like this. Also, I wanted to mention that um, if you wanna make these at home, Disneyland has released their recipe online, I guess because of the park being closed. So you could get their recipe offline. We do our own recipe here that's uh, our own private recipe, so I don't want to share that with you <laughs> if you don't mind. But you can always come and pick it up on Secret of Mile too, and we also have delivery as well. So to, to make your own churros though, you would need oil. We use canola oil, and we use a extruder, which helps shape it like this, and it's hand twisted. Um, you can also buy those yourself do your home version of that um, and we cook it in our oil and then we dust it with um, cinnamon and sugar we use a half a cup of sugar to a half a teaspoon of cinnamon and have, you let it cool for a, a minute or two and then you can sprinkle it with sugar so those were a few of our items the ice cream cookie sandwich authentic handmade churro and our funnel cakes <laughs> How's that churro sundae, huh? It's really good. It's really good. <laughs> I know. I couldn't wait to. <laughs> <laughs> she has to dive really in, yeah. But we have some other items here, too. You can come check us out. Um, we're doing delivery. We're open during um, this time. And um, we're here to, for pickup for delivery. And um, uplift Long Beach, okay? Thanks. We got Pino's palette coming up, and then after that, our good friend Dirty Patty. Hey, Patty! Hi, everyone. My name is Monica, and this is 
Hi, everybody. Mark, <laughs> and we're the owners of Pinot's Palette Long Beach. And uh, we just want to say thank you for uh, joining us today for hashtag Giving Tuesday and supporting the local artists here in Long Beach and the businesses. And in and in this time of, of uncertainty with uh, COVID-19, uh, a lot of people are staying at home. So what I'd like to do is show you something that you can do at home that uh, you can use you, using your own uh, supplies at home, uh, things that you might have around the house. And what we're going to do is we're going to paint this painting here. Uh, this is one, it's called Sun Beach. It's one painting that we do in the studio quite often. And we're going to show you how to paint that with shower shaving gel or shaving gel and food coloring. And all you have to do really is just put a little bit of food color or shower gel in there, put a little bit of food coloring in there, and you mix it all up. Okay, and it's going to make a nice little red, red color. Okay, so you're going to do that for all the colors that you want to mix. So if you want to mix yellow and green and blue, and I even mixed a, I even made a black. And the way I made black was actually with uh, blue and red, believe it or not. And this is kind of like a mossy green for yellow and, and green. Anyway, you're going to mix all your colors up. Okay, and then what you're going to do in any paper that you have around, actually, this is actually some some uh, printer printer paper that I have. But if you have construction paper at home, that works just as well. Okay, and then what you're going to do is you're going to get a brush. We have our painting brushes here in our studio, but you can use any brush at home. Uh, you can even use basting brushes from uh, the supermarket. So any kind of brush that you can use, and then you're going to start painting. Okay, so we're going to start with our red, and we're going to we're going to put a little bit of red down here for for the bottom portion. Okay, and you're just going to paint like you would normally paint. Okay, there you go. And then say we want to do some sky color. We want to do some blue. So let's put some blue, blue sky color up here. Okay, and you're going to paint all that in there just like that. Okay, and you can just, and then add a little bit of yellow if you want. You're just going to, you're just going to go crazy and do anything that you want here. Okay. Because really, painting is just about being creative and putting putting just something out on the on the canvas. So once you do get something on the canvas, there you're going to end up with something a little bit like this. And if you look at the other painting, kind of looks a little bit like it, right? So once you do your 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 background, and we call it layering in the studio, do your background then with a sharpie. You can use any kind of sharpie, and then just put in your details and paint all your details in there. So there you go. That's all you have to do. When you want to uh, paint at home, you, you can't, you don't have an excuse because you have what you need right there in your house. So as a thank you for watching today and to say how much we appreciate you, we'd like to give away five painting kits from our studio along with guided instruction through one of our virtual classes. So the first five people to email ads at lbpost.com with the, the subject line, uh, Uplift Pino, will receive one of these kits. And the kit includes canvas, paints, uh, brushes, and the option for you to join one of our virtual classes, our live virtual classes, they're interactive, uh, that we offer at our studio. So contact us, contact us at uh, uh, pinospalette.com forward slash long dash beach and uh, we can tell you a little bit more about it. So thank you again for joining us today. And to quote one of our mentors, Bob Ross, every, every day is a good day when you paint. So happy painting. Hi, I'm Dirty Patty. You know, as a young puppet, I was thirsty for art and inspiration. I had so much cooler friends who would take me down to Long Beach. It was here I experienced my first open mic and my very first live show on 7th and Cherry. Ah, so many memories, so many rich textures of creativity. I was fueled. Now I call it my home and I've made so many friends. People are friendly here even to a puppet. That's how I know we're gonna be okay, Long Beach. We've got a lot of heart. Thank you for watching. And thank you for any donations that you're able to make. 
Stay weird, stay safe, and always keep it dirty and support your local artists. I love you, Long Beach. Thank you, Patty. She's wonderful, isn't she? And she's right. Long Beach is a great town that comes together. DIY. It's oh, sorry. Frog, sitting on the lily pad, singing a song. He's been hopping along all day. Well, he loves to sing and play his guitar every evening in the swampy marsh. All alone, always. Live along out on the lawn with the deal, the other frogs. And for a while, he was on his own, yeah. One day, Mr. Firefly, he heard the frog and it stopped on by. He said, Hey, there, frog, I'm a banjo player. Let's go to The frog said, No, 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 no. The fire that singing his songs, they're both playing along. Oh, dear. well, they love to sing and play those guitars every evening in the swampy marsh. Then one day, Mr. Bullfrog said, They said, Hey, there, Mr. Firefly. You think there's someone that we will find that knows how to play the saxophone? And right out of the Everglades, rocked out Mr. Alligator. He said, Have you ever wondered, how would I make a piñata at home if I needed to? Well, now you're going to find out. You're welcome. Hi. 
Hi everyone, happy Cinco de Mayo. I'm Shelly with Craft and Light. I want to say thank you to the Arts Council of Long Beach for having me and Long Beach Post for inviting me, for partnering together with the local businesses to have a great event. Today is Giving Tuesday where we're supporting local businesses and wonderful organizations for a great cause. So today I get to share with you how to create a piñata on this fun occasion. You can create a piñata anytime, whenever you want, using household materials and even some things that you might find at Target. And I'm going to show you the simple steps to creating that. So the first thing you're going to need is this balloon. You need about 30 centimeters standard balloon. You can go even bigger than that, but this you can find at Target, you can find tons of them, and it's easy to create into a piñata. So blow it up and let's attach it to a nice base. I picked a bison jar, you can use a coffee mug, and just have it sit upright just like that. Once you've created your balloon, you're going to create your strips of paper about one and a half, two and a half inches wide. This is going to go on top of our balloon and start to be our mold. We're going to have to cut up our strips of paper. We're going to create a paste made of flour and water and some salt. So a very quick recipe, it's one to one ratio, two cups of flour, two cups of water, one tablespoon of salt though, just so that it doesn't get any mold on it as it dries. I'm gonna place those newspaper strips into my paste. My paste is gonna be a little thick, which is what we want, nice and thick. I'm gonna place those strips of paper onto my balloon. You can, and I'm gonna do this all around. I've already started a few already. I'm gonna do this to the entire balloon. Once I have my first layer covered, I'm gonna wait overnight for it. And then I'm gonna check it out, maybe even blow dry it some more just to make sure. I'm gonna do it a second time. So I now I have two layers of very good hard reinforced mold. So now that I have done my entire mold of balloon, it looks like this after it's done. It's kind of powdery, the flour has dried, and it's, it's super hard, it's gotten pretty hollow there. It's a nice hard knot. Now it's time to decorate, but before I do, just like you do when you're painting, you wanna prep your canvas. And I don't really care for this flower material, this flower look, because I don't want my, my pretty decorations to go on top of that. So what I did is I reinforced it again with some tissue paper, and some Maj Podge. What I wanted to do is I wanted to do lots of vibrant colors because it's single day mile. So I chose some pinks, I chose some yellows, I got the tissue paper that's polka dots, I found some pom-poms hanging out in the back, and I just decided to just go out with it, and just making sure that I just had everything covered. And then I wanted to add some length to it at the bottom and put that at the bottom of my base. So what happens is that your top is going to be where your hole is. And so as you see, the hole, I popped the balloon already, and now there's this hollow hole inside, and that's gonna become my top. tape and then you're going to create four holes north south east and west and this can be created by poking you can do a good toothpick you can put it with some scissors scissors is what I like to use but you know anything that keeps that right there in that firm part north south east and west once I have that I'm going to string my ribbon around that through the holes and create a nice knot north, south, east, and west. I'm going to place my cardboard on top. I'm going to reinforce it with more duct tape. Even the glue gun will work. 
I'm gonna cover this up with some more tissue paper and then I'm gonna hang it and it's a wrap. It's perfect. And it's a nice pretty colorful pinata that is ready for you to bust open and enjoy. Well, everyone, that's our craft for today. I cannot wait to see your pictures when you actually make this pinata and all the different styles that we're gonna have throughout Long Beach. For the first five people, we have an opportunity for the first five people that email ads at longbeachpost.com, again, ads at longbeachpost.com, we're offering a free workshop online. We're doing virtual workshops, would love to have you join us. You'll get a free kit and a workshop for the first five people that email ads at longbeachpost.com. Please don't forget your subject line is Uplift Craft and Light, Uplift Craft and Light. And again, the first five people that do will receive a free workshop and the kit. So I can't wait to have you all in the studio when we reopen. Uh, till then, I'm Shelly at Craft and Light. Feel good and be well. Hi everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you for joining Uplift LB and joining us for this virtual art experience. We're so happy to be here. My name is Michelle and I'm from the Nonprofit Partnership. And I just wanna thank all of you for joining us tonight. And I wanted to say a few words about the work the nonprofits are doing in our community. Throughout the city of Long Beach, our nonprofits are stepping up to support the community during this crisis. From temporarily closing programs to keeping individuals safe by staying home, to shifting services to meet increasing needs of their members, nonprofits continue to be the fabric of the community and the connection we all need to make it through this uncertain time. We wanna thank all of the nonprofits for their hard work keeping us connected, fed, housed, advocating for economic relief, caring for the community. And we wanna really thank everyone for joining us tonight on this virtual art experience. If you haven't already, you can text GIVE to donate to an art, an artist, art nonprofit, or small business, or a nonprofit. Um, that number is 562-373-0579. You can text GIVE and the number's on the screen. I know it's on this Facebook page as well. So we just wanna thank you for your donations and supporting the community. I also wanna give a special shout out to the amazing team at the Long Beach Post for keeping us informed for the last six weeks. And in addition to that, really thinking about the hardest hit businesses and sector in our community and putting on this amazing event tonight. We also want to thank our partners at the Arts Council for supporting as well. We love you, Long Beach, and we look forward to seeing all of you virtually at, as soon as we can be together again. We look forward to seeing you in person as well. We hope you have a fun night, and thanks. Hey, man, and I love you, Long Beach, okay? Let me, let me just make that clear. In fact, we found out a lot of you are out there right now. We're really happy you're sticking with us. Now, we get a beautiful tour from the Long Beach Historical Society. Let's get smart together. I'm Julie Bartolotto, and I'm the Executive Director of the Historical Society of Long Beach. I'm standing here in our gallery at 4260 Atlantic Avenue in Bixby Knowles. This is our Anderson Gallery. The Historical Society of Long Beach has a fantastic photographic collection containing over 100,000 images. We also have maps, documents, oral histories, and other materials. We use these materials in exhibitions, such as the one that's on now called Water Changes Everything. We also use these archival items to put on programs, such as our annual historical cemetery tour. I hope you'll support us by going to hslb.org. This is our historical timeline, and we're gonna take a look at some of the images that tell you about local history. This is the Magnolia Pier. It was taken in 1884. Look at those great waves. The next shot shows one of the Historical Society's longtime volunteer and members, Loretta Berner, as a child on the left. This 1918 photo was taken at Jotham Bixby's Bean Ranch in Bixby Knowles. This 1920s photo shows 
the peninsula and Ocean Boulevard from a biplane. Here we have a 1930 photo of Ocean Boulevard. At the far left, you can see the Villa Riviera. Then you can see the Breakers building, the Jurgens Trust building, which has been torn down, and the Ocean Center building. This is a photo from 1933. It shows damage to a bakery that was on Redondo Avenue. This 1943 photograph shows the crew who built the 2000th C-47 at Douglas Aircraft. This photo shows oil derricks through the windshield of a bus in 1946. Here in 1950, we have the Junior Usher Board at Grant AME Church located on Alamitos Avenue. And finally, here's a 1975 photo of the Long Beach Grand Prix with the oil islands in the background. Hi, I'm John, membership coordinator for the Historical Society of Long Beach. I'm the guy that tries to get more of you to support our mission to collect, preserve, and present the history of the Long Beach community we share so that we can feel more connected to the events and the people who paved our way. This is the opening image for our current exhibition, Water Changes Everything, which illustrates how our water resources, both fresh and from the sea, affected the development of Long Beach. Looking west from over Alamitos Bay in 1923, it clearly shows a landscape in transition from its natural state to the urban fabric we're familiar with today. We see Signal Hill covered with oil wells after the discovery of oil in 1921, the Spelmont Heights, and off in the distance, downtown Long Beach, Bixby Park is the dark spot, Belmont Pier, and that barren area in the center is Belmont Shore. Only a year or so before it would have looked like the rest of the wetlands, above sea level only at low tide. We dredged the channels and dumped silt above the sandbars. Once above sea level at high tide, development began. Naples and its iconic canals are already in place. Much of this landscape will likely be reclaimed from the sea as sea levels rise in the face of climate change, scenarios our city planners are already contemplating for us today. Hello, my name is Brian Chavez, and I'm the Gallery and Collections Coordinator here for the Historical Society of Long Beach. Part of my job involves taking care of some of our city's most treasured artifacts, in rooms just like the one that you see right here. One of our most recent collections to make its way into this room is the Long Beach Redevelopment Agency Collection. The Long Beach Redevelopment Agency was founded in 1961 in an effort to promote the economic and structural renewal of our city. So that involved completely restructuring neighborhoods, many of them that we're familiar with, and others that don't even exist anymore today. Neighborhoods like this one. This one's called The Jungle. And The Jungle was actually located between Ocean Boulevard, the Los Angeles River, and Queens Way. Here's another photograph. This incredible collection allows us to see neighborhoods like this one that no longer exist and give us an idea of what kind of businesses were there, what kind of people lived there, what did it look like, what kind of architecture did we have. But it really is an incredible insight of a story that hasn't even been told just yet. So we're excited that this collection is now being offered to you. Um, unfortunately, in order to access the collection, you do have to come in and due to COVID-19 restrictions, we don't have that publicly available to you yet. But as soon as social distancing restrictions are lifted, we're more than welcome to have you over here. Now, you do have to send in a research request first. You could do that at hslb.org. In the meantime, however, if you want to know what is in this collection, the Online Archive of California, as well as hslb.org, has a full inventory of what we have in here. So we hope that you have fun at least looking at that for now, inspiring your brain as to what you could come up with, uh, and we hope that you're able to tell these incredible stories soon with us. Thank you so much, and we wish you all the best of health. Wait.
waves. What we could have that. Alessandra, take us take us somewhere. Um this is a song I wrote many years ago. But I feel like it's a great song to sing right now. And it's called Blow All Your Troubles Away. And hey, that's exactly what you should do. Let's tighten up this capo a little bit. washing your hands, doing all those things they're telling you to do. But really just, you know, 
keep out there living and loving and healing and all the things. Um, you can follow me on Instagram. Uh, it's my name, but with four S's, A-L-Y-S-S-S-S-A-N-D-R-A. My website is talesofalessandra.com, and that's just with two S's. I know. Um, anyways, thank you. Support your local nonprofits, and keep watching. Bye. Thanks, Alessandra. Hey, we've got our last trivia question. Again, when at lbpost.com. Subject line is Trivia 5. This time, 50 bucks back at Grocery Outlet, okay? Because we've been doing a lot. You've been burning a lot of calories. You probably want to eat something. Hey, Twitter, why don't you tune in, man? Facebook is all over this, and we'll, we'll get nothing from you. Maybe we should show that picture of those waves again. Those were, those were hot.
Support those arts, man. Long Beach is blessed with great artists, great art, just a great community. Oh, that's it.